Okay, good evening, everybody. We are going to continue our study in the book of Proverbs tonight with the Proverbs, what they say about work. As you know, we've been studying about the topical sections of Proverbs at the end of the chapter, or at the end of the book, sorry, the latter chapters. And so we're going to continue that. We've talked about friendship and family. Tonight, we're going to talk about work. What does the Proverbs have to say about work? I think this will be a good study for us. Before we dive in, let's go to God in prayer together. Our Father above, be with us as we study your word tonight. Give us the wisdom to see the wisdom that Solomon has given us through this book of Proverbs. We know that you work through his pen to give us this information. Help us to use this wisdom as we work, not only secularly, but spiritually. Help us to always work heartily as to you and help us to always focus our mind on the work that you've created for us in Christ Jesus. We pray all this through his name. Amen. Okay, taking care of business. Let's talk about what the Proverbs have to say about work. Everybody's involved in it in some way or another. You either work secularly, you work for yourself, you may uh, work at home, you may work within your family, and you may work a small summer job, whatever the case may be, everybody works. And we all need to know what the Bible says, especially the book of Proverbs, about work. So we're going to talk about that tonight. Now, as we dive in, it's important for me to note that as Christians, we should always be examples. That's what the Bible teaches us, whether it's Matthew chapter 5 telling us that we are salt and light, whether it's 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 that tells us that we need to be about the business of making a living and earning a living and that we should be an example to the church of doing that, or our passage that we're going to look at here, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12, when Peter says that our conduct among the Gentiles should be honorable so that when they, they speak evil against us, they may see our good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Everything that you and I do as Christians should be able and should be to the end that we set an example for other people. And that's what Peter's getting at here in 1 Peter chapter 2. Let your conduct set an example so that when people try to call you an evildoer, say that you're up to no good, when they try to say that, they'll see your good works and ultimately glorify God. That should be our goal, our aim, our desire. We want to be examples. And all of us have the opportunity to be an example when it comes to the workforce. In some way, shape, form, or fashion, you're around other people. And the way that you work, the thing, uh, the, the effort that you put forward to what you're doing is an indication of how much not only you love what you do, but how much you love the Lord to work in that particular area to glorify him. And it doesn't matter what area you're in. Your work ethic is an indication. It's a reflection back on the Lord. And we should be willing to give a great reflection back on God, that our example should be great. We should be people that work harder than anyone else, that uh, we're up at work before anyone else. We're the last one to leave. We have the greatest work ethic in the people around us. And we work hard because the Bible says we need to, in everything we do, work heartily as to the Lord, not to man. Everything you do needs to be in respect to the fact that I'm working for the Lord. I'm using my example, my influence, my knowledge, and my skills to give glory to him. So that should be my effort and my aim. So we're going to look at three areas of work that are extremely important out of the book of Proverbs, and that lesson that we're going to look at tonight will be yours. So our first area of ideas here in the book of Proverbs is that the book of Proverbs indicates to us that we need to put work in its proper place. I don't need to go into a lot of detail to convince you, I'm sure you already know this, that the book of Proverbs gives us information about work and we desperately need that in America because in our society, in our country, we have made work our number one aim and goal. In fact, we would often, uh, for instance, skip church, skip worship, for something that we would never miss work for. We would oftentimes uh, sacrifice something within our family that we would never sacrifice in work. Work has become an idol to us in our society. Now, I say that. Understand that I do believe work is necessary. 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6, we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from brothers who walk in idleness, not accord with the traditions that you receive from us. Paul tells them in 2 Thessalonians, hey, you need to be careful because you don't need to be around people that are lazy and idle and aren't doing anything. You need to work hard and be around people that work hard because not working 
not putting in your greatest effort does not accord with the tradition that you receive from us, 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6. And I'm sure we're all familiar with 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. We quote this passage a lot. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. We understand that God has placed the responsibility on men to provide for their family and to make sure their family is cared for. And if they fail to do that, 1 Timothy 5 verse 8 says they've denied the faith and they're worse than an unbeliever. God looks down on that shamefully when someone is unwilling to care for and provide for his family. And so we need to put work in its proper place. First of all, understanding it is necessary. So that's the first place we need to put work. But no, notice that work is necessary, but it's not the most necessary thing. That's important for us to note. Because in the Bible, it tells us that we can have misplaced priorities. And those misplaced priorities can be very harmful to our well-being. Now, many of you are probably going to be familiar with this illustration that I'm going to read to you. Hopefully, it will serve you well. But uh, this is one I've read before, probably not here, but I've read it before. And uh, I think it teaches us a valuable lesson about misplaced priorities. That is, I can be so focused on something that I miss what's right in front of me. Uh, Holmes and Watson went on a camping trip, and after a good meal, they laid down for the night, and they went to sleep. In the middle of the night, Holmes woke Watson. He nudged his friend, and he said, Watson, look up at the sky and tell me what you see. Watson replied, well, I see millions and millions of stars. Holmes asked him, well, what does that tell you? Watson pondered on that question for a moment, and he answered this way. Astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies, potentially billions of planets in front of my eyes. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo. Horologically, I deduce that the time is approximately a quarter past three. Theologically, I can see that God is all powerful and that we are small and insignificant. This next word I always have problems with. Meteorologically, I suspect that we, have a, we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. He turned to Holmes and says, what does it tell you? Holmes was silent for a moment and spoke up. No, dummy, someone stole our tent. <laughs> you know, it's, it seems to me so obvious that we can be so focused on something that we miss what is obviously in front of us. Sometimes we can be so focused on our work that we miss the obvious necessity of us putting our priorities right. Misplaced priorities can be very harmful for us. For instance, the book of Proverbs tells me that righteousness, not riches, is what is truly profitable. Proverbs 11 and verse 4. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. It also tells me that I need to seek righteousness and not riches later in this chapter in verse 28. Whoever, tr whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. Those who pursue after righteousness, things go well for them. But whoever trusts in riches, Proverbs eleven twenty eight 28 says, it's not going to do you well. Riches cause us to fall often. So we need to understand that it's better for me to have a very little when I am righteous than to be rich and be wicked. Proverbs 16, verse 8. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. So it's important for you and I to know, know that work is necessary. But we also need to see in Proverbs 16 and verse 8 that while work is necessary, it doesn't need to be misplaced in our list of priorities. It needs to be put in its proper place. So our first point is we need to remember to keep work in its proper place. Now, how do I keep work in its proper place? Two very easy ways. The first is that I need to remember that I should always involve God in my business affairs. I will never, ever have more joy and satisfaction and more worth come from my work than when I place God in my affairs. For our efforts will be more likely to succeed when we put God in the center of our affairs. Proverbs 16 and verse 3, commit your work to the Lord, your plans will be established. I will statistically have more success when I am living the life of a righteous child of God than I will if I'm living a wicked life of someone in the world because God is at the center of my plans. Think about what he did to Joseph, Genesis 39 verses two through three. The Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man. He was in the house of his Egyptian master and his master saw that the Lord was with him, that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. You see, God was with Joseph. 
And if we place God at the center of our plans, I fully believe that this principle will be true too. God will be with us as we work. We are more likely also not only just to, just to be successful in what we do and be more uh, reliable and be more profitable because we're living the Christian life, not because God is necessarily going to pour that onto us. I think that living the Christian life also helps us moralistically and honestly. Uh, we'll retain more business in our work. We will earn the trust of others more when we're living the righteous life. But we're also going to be more likely to enjoy what we receive. The blessing of the Lord makes rich and he has no sorrow with it. I am gaining righteous things. Now, when I get something by dishonesty, guess what? When I don't have the Lord in my plans, it may bring sorrow with it and guilt and frustration. But when I put the Lord in the middle of my affairs, great things are on the horizon. We need to remember also that business has its shortcomings. Business shouldn't be number one in our list because it cannot deliver like God should when he is number one in our list. We will never know what happens tomorrow. Proverbs 27 and verse one says, don't boast about tomorrow. You don't know what a day may bring. We don't know what's going to come later down the road. And so we don't need to, to boast in tomorrow. James chapter 4, verses 13 through 16, tell me the same thing, that I need to say, you know, if the Lord wills, I'll go to such and such a city and work and make a profit. You see, wealth, according to Proverbs chapter 23, verses 4 and 5, is a fleeting commodity. It's not worth killing myself over in order to obtain. Do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. When your eyes light on it, it is gone or suddenly it sprouts wings flying like an eagle toward heaven. That's Proverbs 23, verses four through five. So I need to be careful to put work in its proper place, to put God at the center of my work and really not take my business dealings so serious, to place them in the, in the role that God should have in my life. So in order for me to, be, to, to, to follow the proverbial wisdom of business, of work, I need to put work in its proper place. Don't put it in God's place. We should stop doing that. If we have done it, we should repent and turn away from it. We don't need to put our work in God's place. What that also means is that my, my relationship with God should often come before my work. And that's an important thing to remember. So the first thing is to put work in its proper place. Secondly, what we see in the book of Proverbs about work is that I should make sure that I'm doing everything I can to be a successful laborer to be a successful laborer. Every person is going to be a worker at some point in life. And Proverbs has a lot to say for people that are workers. We're going to talk about managers in just a moment, leadership. But to be a successful worker, I need to have certain mentalities. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 26 tells me something I shouldn't do. Like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to those who send him. I remember I brought this passage up some time ago and I asked y'all, what does vinegar to the teeth mean? Well, I learned that in the time sense, and it is like smoke to the eyes. The sluggard is that way to the one who sends him. It is painful, it is annoying, and it will not help you. Laziness does not get us anywhere as a laborer, as a worker. We're only a burden to the people who have sent us if we find ourselves to be a sluggard. Now, we also need to understand Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 9, which teaches a similar principle, but a little bit different way. Whoever is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys. To be slothful in the things that I do, to be lazy in the work that I'm trying to do, it will ultimately not only ruin me, it will ruin who I'm working with, the company I'm a part of, the people that I'm, I'm associated with. Laziness ruins not just the person who is lazy, but it, it decays the people around them. It's similar to what we would call in the book of Proverbs, the rottenness in bones. It is rotting from the inside out. And so we don't want to be lazy. So that's something we shouldn't do. You want to be a successful worker? Don't be lazy. Be willing to work hard, which is our second idea. We should be willing to work hard. Developing skills in our work is something useful. And we all know it takes time to develop a skill, especially to master a skill, to get very talented and good at it, to encounter all the situations that will come up where we can deal with that problem and be able to skillfully move past it, to overcome obstacles. And listen to Proverbs 22 and verse 29. Do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure man. What the Bible tells me here is that in, in my line of work as a skillful person, if I have worked hard and I have, I have applied myself and I have done everything I can to make myself the best worker possible, people are going to notice it. It's not going to go unnoticed when you work hard. Everyone notices a hard worker, Proverbs 22 and verse 29. He's not going to stand before obscure man. He is going to stand before kings. 
not only that, but Proverbs 12 and verse 24 tells me that if I'm diligent in my work, it will ensure good things. The hand of the diligent will rule, while the slothful will be put to forced labor. Being diligent in my work helps me stay in control of my situation. I will rule over whatever I'm, I'm dealing with. I will have control if I'm diligent. But the slothful person, they're just forced to do labor. They're told what to do. The diligent man, he can direct where he's going and what he's doing. I should be willing in my life to do Proverbs 14 and verse 23. In all toil, there is profit, but mere talk tends only to poverty. What does that mean? I need to be understanding this principle, that I will impress others more with the quality of my work more than I will the quantity of my words. I can talk all day long about what I'm going to do, but until I show it, that is where the true reliability is. Hard work can bring great blessings if I'm willing to be diligent and point myself towards it. And that's what Proverbs 12 and verse 14 says. It'll t it says that, that hard work will reward me. So that's how to be a successful worker. Don't be lazy. Work hard. Apply yourself. Develop skills and become a more talented person. Our third and final point about work is this. In order to successfully follow what the Proverbs says about work, I need to not only put work in its proper place, be willing to work hard and not be lazy, but also I need to understand that one day I might be a leader and I need to be willing to be molded by the Proverbs to be a successful manager or leader. As time passes, I will develop skills by working wisely and diligently. I will find myself rewarded by my labor. I will become skilled at what I do. And one day I will be a leader and I need to be willing and able to be formed by these Proverbs to be a good leader. So what does the Proverbs have to say about a wise manager? A wise manager first in Proverbs 21 and verse five is someone who is diligent in their planning. They don't get too hasty to get things done. That's an important role of leadership, I think. They are wise in what they do. Now, when a hasty decision needs to be made, they make a hasty decision, but they ensure that they do it with wisdom. The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. I have learned in my life that to slow things down and consider my options, to evaluate what's going on, to make a plan, to work that plan, and follow the attack plan I've laid out is the best option for me. So if I'm going to be a wise leader, I'm going to make sure that I'm diligent in my planning. I'm not hastily coming to decisions that are based on emotion constantly. Not only that, I need to make sure that I am nurturing and utilizing the counsel of others, Proverbs 15, 22. Without counsel, plans fail. I've often been told, and I've, I've realized this to be true, that every good leader does not stand on an island by himself. He has a row and a room full of counselors and confidants that are pointing him in the right direction. Wise counsel plans fail. Without counsel, without counsel sorry, plans fail. But with many advisors, they succeed. If I'm going to be a wise leader, a wise manager, I'm going to utilize the counsel of others. And then if you want to go over to Proverbs 27, you can. We're not going to read it in our lesson tonight, but you can read these passages. Basically what Proverbs 27 verses 23 through 27 tells me is that I need to stay on top of things. Stay on top of what's going on. Make plans for the future. Be prepared for what may come. Now, it's not wrong for us to plan for the future. What's wrong is for us to plan for the future with certainty without putting God into the equation. That's the problem in the Bible. We need to plan for the future with God in the midst of that plan. Proverbs 27 tells me that I need to stay on top of things as a manager. Not only that, but being a good leader is also seen in Proverbs 28 and verse 16 as someone who's not an oppressor. A ruler who lacks understanding is a cruel oppressor, but he who hates unjust gain will prolong his days. I don't need to be oppressive if I'm going to be a good leader. I need to have understanding. I need to have the ability to put myself in other people's shoes. That's one good quality of a leader. Uh, they teach us this in counseling classes. You're going to counsel somebody, you've got to be willing to sit down and put yourself in their shoes and evaluate, how would I be feeling in this situation? How would I address this problem? How would I react if this happened to me? And while I can't fully understand that being removed from a situation, I will have understanding and not just be a cruel oppressor pushing down on people and just putting my thumb on them and making them do this, 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 and this. I will have understanding. That's what a good leader does. Proverbs 29 and verse 20, uh, Proverbs 29 and verse seven tells me that I need to be concerned about the rights of others. A righteous man, he knows the rights of the poor. 
A wicked man doesn't understand such knowledge. You see, a righteous man, he understands the rights of his people. He looks down at those that he's with and he says, you know what? These people have certain rights and I need to, I need to understand what it is that is valuable and important to them. What do they believe is so valuable? I need to understand their way of thinking, their rights. Proverbs 29 and verse 7. Not only that, I need to just not just understand them, but I need to treat them right. Whoever pampers his servant from childhood will in the end find him his heir. I need to provide good treatment. And if I do, good treatment gains loyalty and love. If he pampers his servant from childhood, in the end, he finds him his heir. Good treatment brings about loyalty and love. Finally, Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 26 tells me that I need to make sure I help people in their benefits. That is, I need to see in them a potential, grow that potential, and show them that their hard work brings about benefits in their life. I need to lead that by example, by word by counsel, all of that needs to be a part of the relationship between a leader and a follower. A worker's appetite works for him. I need to show someone that their benefits of their work are valuable to them. A worker's appetite works for him. He works by his appetite. He sees the value. He sees the need. He's going to work after that. So he will be diligent in his efforts. His mouth urges him on place before them the thing they desire, show them how their hard work could evaluate and and get them to that point of great effort, of great potential, of great gain. And not only are they working for themselves, but they're working for you. And they're not having to be oppressed and pushed and urged. They're seeing the benefit for themselves and they're working hard. That's a great leader. I think the problems are filled with tons of other stuff. These are the ones we wanted to point out tonight. So whether you're a laborer, you're a manager, you're a worker, you're a father, you're a husband, you're a wife, you're an elder, you're a deacon, you're a minister, whatever, we should all be hard workers for the Lord. And remember Matthew 6, 33, that if we seek first the kingdom of God, we put work in its right priority and its right place, his righteousness is something I should seek, then all these things will be added to you. That is what the Proverbs have to say about work. Thank you for tuning in tonight. I hope you were blessed by this study. And I hope you have a righteous and wonderful afternoon. God bless you. And uh, we will be seeing each other again on Wednesday night.